We have now seen several methods on how to factor these auxiliary numbers. So if you find a normal garden variety number, which has potentially some small factors, how to factor it. And now it's time to go back to hard to factor numbers. So these are, fact these are numbers which typically have two large prime factors, which are about the same size. So these are like RSA numbers and simpler. Now, as you can see from the slide title, not all of those numbers are hard to factor. So let's, as a preliminary step, investigate what other numbers are easy to factor. Now, 3 and 23 is a number which I postulate is easy to factor. So let's look at this number a little bit. Now, one thing you might notice is that 3 and 23 is just one less than 3 and 24. Ooh, okay, cool. So, okay, another thing you might notice is that 3 and 24 uh, is the square of 18. So that one you probably learned at some point when you learned up all the squares up to 20. So 3 and 24 is 18 squared. So what we're looking at there is 18 squared minus 1. And another thing from elementary mathematics, and I promise we'll get back to real cryptography and factoring hard numbers. Another thing from ele elementary mathematics is the uh, Bernoulli's third theorem that you have a squared minus b squared is a minus b times a plus b. Okay, so 18 squared minus 1 squared is 18 minus 1 times 18 plus 1, also known as 17 times 90. Ah, okay, something actually happened here. So all of these elementary stuff has actually factored 3 and 23. Namely, it factors into 17 times 19, which are both as large primes as it gets for a number of this size. So in principle, this should be a hard to factor number, but we factored it quite efficiently by noticing that it was like 18 squared minus 1. Now, in general, you might observe that if you take the square root of a number, here in this case, 323, Taking the square root of that, and it's very close to an integer, 17.97 and a bunch of more digits. So this is pretty large, it's almost 18. And so you might think, well, this is a little bit strange. So maybe this is actually a number where the two factors are very close together. And so then you try square root of n, square root of n minus 1, of course, and that is an integer, so you've got to keep the floor of it. This is the floor of it minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. Of course, you will only look at the odd numbers and then well does this work yes it does work it even works for any integer n but it's not necessarily very efficient i mean this is basically um, trial factorization where instead of starting at one and going up to square root of n you're starting at square root of n and going down to one this is only efficient this is only finding factors after a few steps if n is a very special form, namely is n is a difference of two squares, a squared minus b squared, and well, since a squared is about square root of n, then b squared must be small, so b is small. So for n of a very, very special form, this form with small b, this method is efficient. Now, <laughs> when RSA says pick two integers of about the same size, it certainly does not mean exactly the same size. It does not say take something so that you have plus and minus. You must never use an integer and then next prime. So don't find p and put q as next prime p because else you're going to encounter exactly this. What you should be doing is picking random numbers of the bit length lambda that is prescribed and then finding or lambda of two was my examples and then finding a prime of that size by picking integers odd integers randomly and checking whether they're prime. Okay, another thing that I've been commenting on in some of the previous videos is computing square roots. I've been saying that if I could compute square roots mod n, I could also factor. And now this slide is going a step further and is saying there's actually an equivalence in the hardness. So computing square roots mod n is as hard or as equivalent to factoring n. And I'm going to give you a clean proof how I turn one into the other. So let me start with a slightly more complicated direction. So assume that we're given an algorithm A that computes square root mod n. So we're giving it some integer c less than n, and it returns a b so that b squared is common to c mod n. Of course, such a b need not exist. 
but if c is a square mod n, then this algorithm will give us such a b. Now, how can we use such an algorithm to factor n? Because that's what we'll need in order to compute the reduction. Okay, so let's take inspiration from what we had on the previous slide. Namely, if we can write n as a difference of squares, or at least if we can write a squared minus b squared is 0 mod n, then n divides a squared minus b squared. We also need that a is not the same as plus or minus b mod n. Now, if that's the case, then this binomial formula means that on the left we're having a minus b times, so here we have a minus b times a plus b. And so that means we're looking at something which contains two pieces. They're not 0 mod n, and so this is typically a non-trivial factorization. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the GCD of a minus b with n, and that gives us a non-trivial factor of n. So there we have our way to split our n. So if n is just the product of two primes, then one will divide a minus b, and the other one will divide a plus b. Okay, well, we have this algorithm a. So how can we use it to compute a squared comma to b squared mod n? Well, what we're going to do is we just feed it some random a, we square it, so let's call this thing c, and now we know that c is actually a square mod n. And then we ask a for a square root. Okay, a might, the algorithm a might just return that lowercase a. That's something we learned already, or it might return minus a. But it doesn't actually know what a we picked. I mean, it picked a random a and squared it. And it doesn't know whether it was larger than n over 2, smaller than n over 2. And actually, we had seen in the, um, in the vi video about the miller rabin test that with 50% probability, if it's two factors, and more than 50% probability, if it's more factors, um, we're having... If we're finding some other square root of this a squared, it is not plus minus a. So the b which the algorithm will return has a 50-50 chance if it's two factors or has a larger than 50% chance if n has more factors to actually give us a non-trivial factor of n. So let's stick with the RSA case. So we have a 50-50 chance that a is not congruent to be plus minus b mod n. Okay, so 50-50 chance means we typically repeat twice, or three times, or four times, until this GCD factors in. So we're using this algorithm A typically, so on average, two times, or two random choices of A in order to factor in. Okay, so that means we have now used this algorithm A in order to factor. That means we have found a reduction from computing square roots to factoring in. The other direction is a bit simpler, as I mentioned, so I'm not going to give the full proof here. So I postulate that computing square roots of module prime powers is easy. There's an algorithm due to Tonelli and Shanks. With the mathematicians among you, you have taken 2WF70. Uh, then you have seen this algorithm. And for the others, I'm just going to give a special case. Um, if you can compute square roots of module prime powers, well, then you know from this Chinese remainder theorem that you can combine those. So if you have modulo p and modulo q, the square roots, you can combine these into computing square roots, modulo n. And so um, as a special case, if p happens to be congruent to 3 mod 4. So I will show you exactly where this condition comes in. And for other numbers, those which are 1 mod 4, there are some similar considerations. For instance, if it's 1 mod 4 but 5 mod 8, then some similarly simple method works, etc., etc. But 3 mod 4 is the one we used. So if p is common to 3 mod 4, let's just think of 7 or think of 11. So then p plus 1 is a number which is 0 mod 4, so up here is an integer exponent. And then I compute just the c from which I want to compute the square root to this integer exponent. And then the claim is that that is the square root of c. I mean, what the algorithm, what I should be computing is the square root of c 
and model P, sorry, this should be a P here. Um, and then if I compute this mod P, well, I know that everything to the power of P is, so to the P minus 1 gives you 1, but I also know that C is a square. So I also know that C to the P minus 1 over 2 is plus 1. Okay, and this is enough to prove that this value is actually a square root of C. So let's square it, and we should get C. Okay, so B squared, then instead of divided by 4, we have a 2 here. And then I'm going to split the plus 1 over 2 into minus 1 over 2 plus 1. The plus 1 is what we want, because we want to say that B squared is common to C, not P. And the other part, well, now we have P minus 1 over 2, and we do know that C is a square. Now if C is a square, that means that this can be written as something else squared, and so this number already to the p minus 1 over 2 is 1. Remember that we have seen this when going through the Ford Hellman attack. Okay, so we have now shown that if I can compute square roots mod n, I can factor, and if I can factor, I can efficiently compute square roots mod n. So that means we have shown both sides of this reduction, so both problems are equivalent. So, well, if you want to have any factorization method that requires you to compute square roots, you haven't actually made your problem any easy. So how can we still use this observation, this example with 323 that I just given, in order to factor numbers? We are unlikely to just find random a and b that satisfy that a squared is common to b squared mod n. So what we're going to do in this, in this lecture is we try to build such a group. I mean, we can plug in an a, but then typically the right-hand side is not going to be a square. So what we want to do is take a whole bunch of numbers on the right and then combining them so that on the left we're also getting a square. Combining means we're taking a1 square times a2 square times whatever square. Well, any square here is a product of ai squares, so that remains a square. And then on the left side, sorry, on the right hand side, I want to combine those into a big system which is also square. So I'm going to build myself such a group. Now, I mentioned already the first steps. So we're picking a random AI, we're squaring it, and now one of the tricks that I'm using in this attack is that I'm looking at this thing here. Well, I reduce it first mod n. So it's now an integer less than n. And then I consider it just as an integer. So I'm forgetting that I reduced it mod n. And I'm factoring it over the integers. So these pj here, those are some prime numbers. And now we're going to see where these auxiliary numbers come in. So these ci's here, those are the m's that I had mentioned before. So those are the auxiliary numbers that I know how to factor. Those are the numbers that I will factor with trial division, Borgio, P minus 1, etc. And so then I'm eventually getting that for each of the CI a product of prime powers. So these PJs are primes, and then I have some integer exponent, EIJ. And I hope that some of the products, so taking CIs together, well, I know that they come from AI squares. And then I hope that on the right hand side I can combine a bunch of those so that I'm having all pj's with even exponents. So there was a reduction mod n at the beginning when I'm computing the ai squared, I'm reducing mod n. But afterwards I'm no longer reducing mod n. Now I'm doing everything over the integers. This factorization is over the integers and this combination is over the integers. So I will get a number which is larger than n but I will not reduce mod n because I want to get prime powers with even exponents. And I do know that, well, uh, the way that reduction mod n works, it doesn't matter when I reduce, so I can also postpone this reduction. Okay, so let's assume that I have such a product of ci. So if I have found a product of ci so that, well, the product of these things has all even exponents. So what does it mean? I'm getting the ci's as the ai squares. So 
so it's a square here on the left hand side and I'm now having from the combination of these CIs or combination of these products of the PJ to the EIJ so what I have on the right hand side I actually have the product over I this product over J then all the PI over the sum of all the EIJ and now I've already simplified this, collected all the same primes together and the combination was such that all the powers are equal. I'm only including CIs where this combination is equal. I have an example on the next slide that will hopefully make this clear. Now if I'm given this, and there are lots of steps to get there, but if I have this, then I actually have that N that modulo n will have an equivalent of squares. And then I can hope that I'm taking the product of the ai minus the product of the pj to only a single power, so pj to the ej, not 2 ej, and I come to the GCD, GCD, I'm getting a factor of n. One last thing that I need for terminology is the term of a factor base. And so when I factor those numbers, well, I'm getting all these relations, and eventually I'll be trying to mix and match those. If I find a very, very large prime, then I'm very unlikely to find a body. So if I'm looking at factoring m with 500 bits, and I'm finding a 400-bit prime, I'm not going to see this 400-bit prime ever again. So I don't want to even bother to remember anything of this relation. That, CI, uh, that AI squared was just not good. That CI will never find a body. This big prime there is just meaning I can't find a relation with this. So I went only interested in factorizations, only interested in relations where these PJs are smaller than some body. So I want that a CI are B smooth. That means that the largest prime factor is less than B. So they factor completely over this factor base. So I'm allowing arbitrary powers of these pj, but I'm not allowing primes larger than b. Okay, so as an example, I have another small number which I want to factor, and as a caveat, small numbers often give weird distributions. And I have some examples of this at the bottom of the slide. Okay, so here I go. I want to factor n, which is 2 and 99. And so I invoke my random number generator. My random number generator says, well, let's pick a equals 96. So I compute a equals 96 squared. I'm getting 246. Then I factor this number. Now, this number is about the same size as 299. So the auxiliary numbers which we encounter here are about as large as the n I want to factor. But as you can see in this example, well, it has small factors. And so I'm seeing a 2, I'm seeing a 3 pretty instantaneously, and I'm seeing a 41. And then I either decide, okay, 41 is likely to be prime, it is actually prime, or I actually invest a little bit of effort in saying it is prime, or I say, well, I've tried my divisions, my algorithms, I've gone up to Pollard row with numbers up to, okay, only 10 or 12 or something would be here, and I haven't found another factor, so 41 is probably prime. And then I remember this relation. Okay, so on the left side here, before the bar, I'm going to write the a, which I squared, and then here I'm going to write all the factors. And I'm going to keep them in columns so that there's a 2 column, a 3 column, and a 41 column. Probably not going to find another 41, so this is not yet dealing with the factor base, it's not yet removing unnecessary relations or unusable relations. The next one, 91 squared, that gives me 208. I'm taking 208 and I factor it. Okay, this is 2 to the 4, so that's nice and smooth, times 30. Eh, another big prime. Okay, 89 squared, that gives 3 times 7 squared. This is about where I would normally stop with my factor base of art for this size. I would either stop at 5 or at 7. So 30 and 41, I would very unlikely include, I would very unlikely include my factor base. 7, I might. So this first relation, I wouldn't have kept the 89, I would have kept 69. Okay, that gives me a 23. So again, there's a large prime, which I haven't matched yet. I continue, 23, why not use that one itself? That's 2 times 5 times 23. This is 
purely coincidence. There was no reason that 23 and 23 shows up here again, but it was just the next number that I tried. And okay, so I put it in the, the factory base. And okay, this also fills in the five column. What's next? 25 squared. Well, that's three cubed. Okay, so at this moment, let me take a look at my matrix here. Well, as expected, I haven't found a match on the 41. I actually have found a match on the 23. That was not to be expected, but I can't combine those two. And I don't have any other row which has a 5. So this column has a single 5. And a bunch of 3s. Now the 7 square appears only in 1, but it appears with an even exponent. And the 7 square comes with a 3. And here is an odd power of 3. So if I take the row of 89 and the row of 25, then I can combine them to, on the right hand side, sorry, on the left hand side, 89 times 25. And on the right hand side, I'm having 3 to the 4 times 7 squared. So both of those are squares. I can, well, I have combined them to even exponents. And this gives me a 4, which is even, so this half of this is 3 squared. And here the exponent is 2, so half of that exponent is 1. Okay, so I have now a congruence of squares modulo my n. And that allows me to factor my n. Nice. So I'm taking the left-hand side, the 89 times, times, uh, times 25, not the square. Remember, this was a squared. It's going to b squared. So I'm taking a minus b and n. So I'm taking the 89 times 25, and I'm taking the 7 squared is 9 times 7. And when I compute this GCD, I'm getting 29. Okay, at this point, I can actually factor 299, and I see that 299 is 23 times 30. As I said, this is kind of the wrong distribution. I shouldn't have seen 23 twice. Actually, I was cheating. When I did this computation, I don't actually record all of those. I also ran through 85. Now 85 is like this super unusual case where I'm seeing a difference of squares right away. 85 squared is 49, which is 7 squared. And then you're taking 85 minus 7, which is 68, which is 2 times 23, you compute the GCD with n, and you're getting 23. So this would have, in just one relation, factor 2 and 99. That shouldn't happen. I mean, this is super unlikely to happen as the numbers get larger and even for such a small example well maybe i should play the lottery today um, this is super unlikely also this one is super unlikely i went through 73 squared 73 squared is 246 which you might remember seeing from the uh, from the 96 at least from the right hand side you recognize it's 2 times 3 times 49 it's exactly the same though so i would also get a complete factorization by combining 73 and 96. So the 41 shouldn't have gotten a match and getting a perfect match where really both rows are identical. This is something you will not encounter with larger sizes. This is really an artifact of doing small examples. On the other hand, I wanted a matrix that fits on here. And so of course I buy into having a small size. In general, this method, um, when you scale it up, the principle works the same, you're picking random numbers, you're squaring them, you're computing the relation. This part here you want to store more efficiently. You want to store this in a matrix and you only want to store the exponents. So the first position is the power of 2, the second position is the power of 3, etc. And you're computing these um, modulo 2 because then you want to find an element where the right hand side is a square. So it means you want to have the combination of those where all the exponents are 0. And so that means you're looking for a kernel vector in this matrix or two. So this row would be 1, 1, a whole bunch of zeros, 1. This would be a 0 and a 1. Because this doesn't need any other relationship to be even. It is even by itself. It needs a 1 there. So these rows which we ended up combining would be 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And the one down here would be 0, 3 more 2 is 1, 0, 0. And then you see you're just adding these rows, adding now more 2, and you're getting the 1, 0, 0, 0, with the 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, and you're getting all zeros. 
Okay, so it's time to summarize this. So this is known as Dixon's method or is the factorization using equivalences of squares. So we have a target integer n, which we assume to be a hard to factor integer, and we want to, well, factor it. We're taking our factor base of small primes, so here we would totally ignore the 41, and I also need to have access to the size of, of the factor base, so that's lowercase f to the size of the factor base. Now I will compute this big way, uh, matrix modulo 2, and so in principle, after f relationship, uh, after having f rows, it's an f by f matrix, I have a good chance that this one has some relationships. But it might be also that it's been done in a bad way. So, or in that I might get some, some GCD which doesn't help me. And so I'm computing somewhat more relations so that I'm fairly likely to be done. Now, each of those steps is just what we've seen. We're picking random integer A. We're squaring, we call the number C. Uh, oops, this should be C in 0 to n minus 1. Change my notation halfway through. Um, then I factor this thing over the integers, and I'm only keeping the relation, relations which factor completely over the factor base. So I'm only taking numbers where these pi's are in the factor base. So if so, then I'm remembering this relation, I'm remembering the a that I put in, I'm remembering the exponents. At that point, I'm still remembering those as natural numbers. Later on, in step three, when I have enough of those, then I only look at these exponents, put them in a matrix, compute it mod 2, and then go to the step of computing the GCD. If I can't find a non trivial kernel vector, then I actually go back to computing more relations, but typically if I'm having m plus, uh, f plus 4, I have a good chance that this, vector, uh, that this, this works. And then I'm putting a, the part of the left hand side, the product of lowercase a's, and I'm putting uppercase a, well the product that is involved in the in the rows. So this is the well, the previous notation, the pj to the two eij, uh, two pj to the two ej, this is just the pj to the ej, so without the g. So that's uppercase b, and I compute the gcd, and that should actually factor it. So this was the methods of uh, Dixon to compute a factorization. And what we're going to see in the next lectures is how to optimize this. Because picking random numbers and hoping that those square is not, uh, that those factor into nice numbers, so when you square them and then factor those, that is not the best method we can do. So the rest of what we're doing is just optimizing, getting better size of these auxiliary integers to factor, and looking at other methods of how to factor those auxiliary integers. But the general method of coming up with the relations, putting them in a matrix, solving this matrix mod 2, and then doing GCD computation to factor, that is a general framework for all the methods you're going to see.